it ne- it never that that school I remember it just like never stops. Like you get up at six o'clock in the morning and you keep moving until you know six, seven, eight o'clock. At- and then when you're at Hell Week, you just keep moving, keep going, keep going, keep, keep one foot in front of the other. <laughs> like, what does this thing stop? You know what I mean? It's a grinder, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Freshman, thanks for joining me on the podcast. Happy to have you on here. You have quite a unique background. We're going to talk about that today. Um, yeah. Again, this is one of those. There's probably not a whole lot of flying involved in it, but your your story to me is pretty incredible. Uh, right. But I want to I want to kick it over to you real quick, and if you give the you know sixty to ninety second elevator pitch, a little bit about your background and what you're doing today, and then we'll we'll jump into it, man. Yeah, man. Um, thanks for having me on the podcast, first of all. But uh, um, long time coming, right? Yeah, well, uh, yeah. Well, this, uh, from back in October, right? Met at the Guns Gear Memorial Golf Foundation. That's tournament. right. So, yeah, that's right. We've, we've been um, working this. Um, let's see, man. I, I grew up in Massachusetts, uh, born and raised. Um, sorry, my son. My son is coming in here. <laughs> What's up, bud? Yeah, um, look at that. Say, hey, made it to the podcast. Uh, yeah, yeah, you made it. <laughs> um, and um, I went off to, I was a swimmer. Those are pretty good swimmer back in the day. And um, I ended up going, um, went to college, went to UNC my first year, and then and then transferred over to University of Arizona and swam there and um, finished with a, an engineering degree. And I had, I had some, I had some hopes of uh, swimming for the Olympics, you know, and um, made it to the trials and and all that other stuff, and, uh, and missed it by two hundredths of a second. So that kind of ended my swimming career. And then um, uh, with an engineering degree, I, I went and worked uh, went and worked for uh, Boeing for a little bit, and then um, then I joined the Navy in two thousand and four. So this is just right after, kind of like nine eleven. I'd been thinking about it, and then. Um, I was like, man, how do, how do I best like serve my country? You know what I mean? In where I was at, uh, as an engineer, I was not having, wasn't that like just zero job satisfaction there. So what were you um, doing for Boeing? What engineering specifically? I was a, a research and design engineer for the Okay. Yeah. So this is way back in the day when it was in its like kind of its infancy. Yeah contract race the u.s government put up for lockheed martin and boeing and obviously lockheed martin ended up getting that contract and um then it was time for me to move on because they wanted me me, me to move to um SeaTac over the Seattle area and i didn't want to do that so joined the navy 2004 um with a with a seal contract went to to buds didn't make it through buds and then i got shipped off to um, first Marine Division as a corpsman. Okay. And uh, I did I did some deployments there. I did uh, uh, I deployed with one five, and then um, first recon battalion, first force time, um, three times, and then um, I saw kind of saw the writing on the wall as a as a recon corpsman. I was like, I need to go somewhere else where I can be operation for the rest of my career. So. Um, 2009, I got out of the Navy and the next day I was in the army <laughs> and switched over to becoming, uh, an 18 series guy, uh, a green beret, a uh, special forces guy. So, um, went through the Q course and went through, um, 18 Delta school. So I became an 18 Delta, got assigned to third group. I was there for about three and a half, almost four years. And then I kind of got the tap on the shoulder and, um, to go over to Delta Force of the unit over at Fort Bragg. And um, so I went over there as a uh, direct support medic and um, finished my time out there in 2020. And um, a couple of things happened in between there where <laughs> uh, they were like, hey, man, you're, you had 16 years or 50, it was like 15 and a half or 16 years. 
um, the guys were like, just, just stick it out, stick it out. You got five more years. And I said, no, I don't have, I have a daughter. I don't even know. Um, I've had some like pretty traumatic things happen to me and I was, and I wanted to play golf for a living. That was always something that I wanted to do. And it was kind of like I was lifting and shifting fire already. So I didn't want my mind somewhere else, especially in that kind of environment that the unit has where it's, it's, it's very focused on that job. And, um, I, I was going to do a disservice to those guys, you know, if I, if my head was somewhere else. So, um, I decided to leave in 2020, like it was kind of crazy. You know, I got out March 1, 2020 and then COVID hit. Right. So here I'm going to go play fresh professional golf and then I can shut down. Um, which is kind of blessing in disguise, man. Like I got to hang out with family a bunch. I got to practice a bunch, you know, I get kind of prepared for, for what I'm, I was about to do. And, um, and then we found ourselves here in St. Simon's Island, uh, moved from North Carolina to St. Simon's, uh, that same year at the end of the year in December. So, um, it, you know, kind of a, kind of a blessing in disguise. Dude. It was, it was cool. A lot to unpack there. I'm going to even, I'm going to pick up almost where you left off there. The end with COVID. Cause I was getting out of active duty 2019 and you know, I got the transition sucked for me. I was just talking to a guy this other day, like, I don't know how it was for you, but getting out, there's so much, there's so many unknowns. You're trying to figure out like where you're going to live, how you're going to pay the bills, all these yeah. things. And had I slipped like seven months later, like I had several buddies who were either retiring or getting out in that February, March time frame, And then yeah. like, the world shut down. They had no job. They were scrambling, trying to get back into the reserves or active duty. Like it was a crappy yeah. time. I think some, you know, it obviously worked out for, for all, for all of them. And I think probably today people would say, Hey, that's a blessing in the sky. It's kind of like you were, they were able to get a job, pay the bills. They got a lot of family time and things like that. But that was a really crappy time period, especially to be separating. And you, you yeah. separated, you didn't retire. No, I, I separated. Yep. Yeah. I ETS in with 16 years on the books. Um, and, you know, going back to 2020, uh, I, you know, I realized, you know, what's funny is when you're in the military, everything's kind of like cookie cutter, you know, right? You get, you know, you, you get your paycheck, you have a chow hall, you have this, you have that, anything you need that they get it to you. And then when, when you get out, you're like, holy, holy cow. Like I have like all that support underneath you is gone. But you realize that all that support, um, that that was underneath you um i don't want to say that it was it's just kind of fluff but the thing is is like you're the one that's creating whatever your situation is right so yes. um you know it took me a little while to kind of figure that one out um but i already had like a, i already you know i still had a clear concise goal of what i wanted to do so whether it was now or later it doesn't really matter i mean my sister had said it really, really well years ago. And this goes back to when I got into the army. So, you know, for some reason the J pass people don't talk, you know, like your secret in a room and secret stuff. Yeah. So when you have a secret in the Navy, it doesn't mean you have a secret in the army. Right. So I got shipped to Fort Sill, uh, at where is it transition course. Right. So I go to this stupid course and <laughs> to be an army soldier and, uh, and, uh, they're like, hey, you got an 18 X-ray contract, but we can't ship you off because you don't have you don't have a clearance. And I was like, well, I had a clearance in the Navy here, and took them two months to like push a button to be like, oh, look at that, you know? Surprise! And my, I was talking to my sister, and she goes, you know, what it really is two months? What's a year in your whole lifespan? You know what I mean? It's really a drop in the bucket, and how you spend that time is the most important thing, right? And that's that was one thing that kind of stuck with me as, as far as like as COVID is concerned and all that other stuff. Um, world shutting down. That was an opportunity for me to kind of reconnect with my wife, my, and my daughter, my son was being born in May of that year. You know what I mean? The little dude that was just up here, yeah. you know? What I mean? <laughs> so um, it was, it was good. It was a, it, it was probably a, a, the best thing that could have happened for me and my family. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome to hear. And that's one of those things too. You can't read the label from inside the jar. I think Mace said that. And it's it's tough to sometimes remove yourself from the weeds and get the fifty, sixty thousand 
foot view, especially as the chapter's being written, right? Like you don't necessarily know how it's going to end and there's a lot of turmoil. It's funny that you mentioned, you know, like J pass and like all these kind of inefficiencies <laughs> that go back and forth. You're like, you would think this would happen and this would be automatic. I, I moved reserve jobs. That was the story is like, so you know, the air force for 16 years has had all like it has paid the same bank account, right? There's been no change. I'm in right. the reserves and I have to move jobs and you know, naturally it's a hundred page checklist all this information already exists in multiple databases throughout the entire air force, which, you know, is a pain for me to get access to, but personnel right. have access to and still pay. They're like, Hey, we need your bank account information. I'm like, just keep paying the same one. No change. Like, yeah, no, sir. We got it. You have to fill out this form, get it signed, get it notarized. Unbelievable. And you're like, and you're like how, how is this even yeah, possible? I dude, <laughs> I have a, I have a tremendous amount of respect for you. Uh, exiting at like that 16 year point. Cause I know that was not an easy decision. Uh, Cause everyone's like, dude, you just got four more years and you get a pension four yeah. more years. But yeah. your story, at least on the air force side, um, I think it's more and more common where guys are punching at the 15, 16 year point, which would have been unheard of 10, 15 years ago. Some of those guys continue on, they go in the reserves and get a reserve retirement you know, mm -hmm. at age 60. That's yeah. not an easy, that's not an easy decision to make prioritizing your family and like I love what you said like lifting and lifting and shifting fires uh what what are the the platitude there was yeah 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 not not an easy thing to do but you already had a goal set and uh pressing out forward which is golf we'll talk about that in a little bit but dude, I, a tremendous amount of respect for doing that not not an easy thing to do and I'm glad it's worked out I'm glad we were able to connect and here we are today doing a podcast well, absolutely here we are man I appreciate so, it. back it all the way up uh so Missed the Olympics just by a couple hundredths of a second, which is yeah. wild to me. Jump into engineering, and you mentioned, hey, you want to serve your country. What was some of the decision-making process? Like, what drove you to the Navy? You enlisted in the Navy, correct? Yeah. So, like, what was that like? What was the decision? What was going on in your mind in that time frame that ultimately ended up putting you into a sailor's uniform? So, um, there wasn't much information about the army or even in the air force, you know, like the combat controllers and the PJs. But I knew I wanted to do something in special operations. Um, you know, like, I'm like, I'm like the product of the eighties dude. So, you know, like <laughs> predator commando, I mean, right. you, you, we could, the list goes on and on. Right. Uh, uh, what was it? Executive decision. Like, Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> so it's like, Oh, like, you know, Navy seals, right. Charlie Sheen, you know? So, all I knew, I didn't know anything about green beanies. I had no idea, right? I didn't know about rangers. I thought they were just infantry. Um, and so I was like, well, you know, if I'm going to special operations, the ticket, the hot ticket in town has got to be the Navy SEALs. You know what I mean? Because they had, and that's when I started to get in the movies. Like there was documentaries about it, you know, about Bud's classes. I started reading like the Dick Marcinko books and I read everything about it and decided, okay, the Navy, Navy SEALs is what I want to do. Thank God it didn't become a Navy SEAL. Cause <laughs> that's, another, that's for another time in the podcast. But, um, uh, but uh, so, you know, and I was a swimmer. So I was like, you know, water's easy, right? Yeah, perfect. Yeah, perfect. And so I, I so that's how, that's how that all got wrong. Isn't it fun? Executive decision, man. That's a throwback. I think I probably watched that movie a hundred times. And have, know, you right? see, have you seen that recently? How cheesy and like just how terrible it is like F one seventeen pulling yeah. up underneath Air Force One, like unloading yeah. a special ops with, team with a boom, <laughs> yeah, <it's like laughs> coming out of the top of it. Yeah, it's pretty. It's pretty cheesy. But uh, back then, you're like, whoa, look at that, right? This so, is awesome. Yeah, just don't let the seal break on the. The connection yeah. <laughs> between the F one seventeen and Air Force One. Yeah, we're not going to make it. You are, and then he shuts. <laughs> <Yeah>. uh, <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, it's right? such a bad. It's such a bad movie, man. But I watched it, yeah, hundreds of times. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and it's and so, um, yeah, I was just starved for information, and that that seemed to be the place to place to be, you know. And and um, yeah, and I, that was that was decision. And so but back then. You know, uh, the SEAL rating, the SO rating wasn't, uh, 
wasn't even around. So you had to you had to pick like your your basically your NEC or MOS. And um, I had a I had a great guy. His name is uh, Dennis Ketchum, Buddy Ketchum. If he's listening to this, man, shout out to him. But he was my Navy SEAL recruit. Okay. And um, yeah, he was a SEAL. This is um, I had moved back from Tucson, Arizona, to Massachusetts after quitting Boeing. And um, he's like, all right, so you want to do something? He takes me down to get the ASVAB done. He's like, oh shit, you scored a ninety nine, which. I didn't know. I was like, is that good? He's like, that you could do whatever you want in the Navy, right? And I said, okay, well, I'll um I'll uh I'll become a corpsman, which is like a you know, like Navy medic, whatever. Yeah. You know it seemed like I'm kinda of my alley, a little bit sciencey, a little nerd like I am. So um and uh so you know, off to Great Lakes and in, in in the core school. And I reported I reported to I reported to Buds in late 2004. All right. Yeah. I kind of cruise, I cruise through boot camp easy, cruise, and then I went to core school and it was like a self. They did a, they did a pilot program where you just basically clicked slideshows and then took a test. And, um, here's some combat gauze and a sucking yeah, chest some, wound. This, yeah, yeah you're good I, to go. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, well, you know, back then, man, they, they didn't even teach anything about trauma. So they taught like a lot of hospital stuff, you know what I mean? Like wound care and all that other stuff, but it wasn't there. Um, it wasn't like your first aid, um, you know, you know, tactical practitioner type stuff. It was, it was just like, if you were stuck on a hospital ship or in a hospital somewhere, this is how you would take care yeah. of it. Yeah. Interesting. Patient. I mean, it makes sense. So 2004 timeframe, right? Like Iraq was probably nine months, 12 months into the Iraq invasion. Afghanistan has been around for a couple of years, but yeah. All those lessons learned. And I, I just think of I mean, like the basic like Air Force self-aid buddy care. I remember like 2007, maybe it was talking about like a sucking chest wound and like how to do it, but like use your ID card and like wrap it up, you know, yada, sure. yada, yada. Yeah. But you saw that thing evolve based on, you know, dudes being in combat for 20 the years and different just, ideologies, different, different ideologies of, of wound, of wounding. You know what I mean? Like how we understand um, we understand ballistics and um, and uh, in how that affects cavities now way more, way better than we ever used to. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, we also like and like shout out to all the special operations medics that are like that love medicine, but you know those guys they they really they move the needle on how the army, the air force, and and the navy do um, teachable C. Combat casualty care, and yeah. it's uh, and they've like they've actually they've actually like rewritten doctrine. Big big army, big navy, big air force, you know, big marine corps. Well, not so much marine corps; they don't have now medics, but um, they've actually rewritten the doctrine to say, "Hey, man, these are what these guys are seeing, and then this is how we're going to implement it with our conventional and, our, and soft forces." You know what I mean? So, like the way the way casualty care goes these days, it's night and day difference it was in 2004 yeah. five, six, you know what I, mean? I didn't know what the fuck i was doing back then man like <laughs> you know <laughs> you know you know what i mean i'm like oh boy here we go you know uh oh, hope no one needs me yeah i yeah. saw this in a movie once yeah I, I mean i remember used to like my first deployment in in um oh five in ramadi i was like i hope nothing happens but you know something ha you know a lot of things happened there but it was like that's that is an internal like lesson learned, but also, um, I you know I wish I had the wherewithal to be like write this stuff down to like give it to somebody that had some uh, uh, that had some pull as far as like teaching everybody. You know what I mean? I could only affect and I could only influence the people that were around me, especially the new guys that were coming in to the aid station at one five, and then but it was like, but. Uh, I, you know, now looking back on it, like you're saying, you can't read the label <laughs> yeah. of the, uh, of the jar from the inside, of, from the inside. It's like, I wish I had somebody that could be a conduit to send that information up and out. You know what I mean? It's tough. I mean, very rarely do organizations have something like that. And I find like, yeah, all right, you're deployed. Like you're so busy just doing your job. There's usually not extra bandwidth to like, Oh, by the way, 
all right, I've got this dialed in. So now I'm going to spend my free time trying to figure out how to make it better. And then two, again, I mean, again, there's usually occasionally get a good boss or something like that, but like it's tough in a big bureaucracy with a lot of red tape to move the needle. Like, unfortunately that's a like, cynical way of looking at it. But like, if, if you wanted to affect some kind of change down at that, that level at a, you know, from a tactical all the way to a strategic level, like that's a tough, that's a tough thing to, to do, if not impossible. It's like, really, yeah. really, really, really hard. Yeah. Yeah. It's, like, it's, it, it's really, really hard. And, and that's like, I, again, it takes, it takes a whole career to get to where you're going. And the only place I ever saw that was at the unit. Like, you know, those guys were, we were writing doctrine on how to use whatever type of kit, whether it be weapons, med, commo, whatever. They're like, what, what are the unit guys doing? Because we want to learn from them. And that's in it, obviously being in it, going from the infantry and then all the way up to there, it's two different milestones there, but it's like, you, when you look back, you go, oh, wow. Like those guys, um, they, they, they were the ones that were affecting change. You know? And- I was like, probably made one parallel that I did see it. So like our weapons officers. So those are you know, the instructor pilots that go out to Nellis. They spend six months. They're a grueling course. They learn, you know, all the secrets, all the integration, um, you know, with national assets, et cetera. And I would say our last deployment. So sniper pod on left 16, I think the time we deployed, we could generate cat three coordinates. Yeah. So not super. I mean, it was, it was good enough for government work. But we actually, because we were dropping so many bombs and we were generating so many cat, we're like pin, like we had all the documentation, all the footage where if we actually overflew a point and draw, you know, shot a laser spot on the excavator or whatever we wanted, spun around, dropped the bomb. Like we had the, the data to say, Hey, you know what? This sniper pod, while it was only tested and proven, you know, at test to generate cat three coordinates. Like we can actually yeah. generate cat two or cat one coordinates. I forget which ones. Yeah. But we, we upgraded it, but it was again, not an easy thing to do, uh, but probably the weapons officer dealing with the weapons school is the only place where like, Hey, this, this thing, this doctrine can get adjusted and fixed, you know, in four pretty, months, which is, which is pretty cool, right? Fa- yeah. Which is lightning fast. Yeah. So it's cool to see those type impacts. Otherwise, yeah, probably in two is like tourniquets. I think tourniquets from a medical standpoint, when you join, it's like you put a tourniquet on, like that leg's gone, that arm's gone, whatever it yeah. is. Yeah. Now, where it, it like tourniquet yeah. everything. And then, you, yeah, you got reperfusion rates and in time and all that stuff. Man, I, you know, like, um, so going back to those days, so after I got out of Buds and then went over to, to First Marine Division. You have to go through a school called uh, Field Medical Service School, which is like, which is like a, it's kind of like a, it's a transition school to teach corpsmen how to how to hang out with the Marine Corps because the Marine Corps is a different culture, you know what I mean? <laughs> but they also they're also teaching you some trauma trauma stuff, how to be how to be the guy on the ground basically saving lives. And I remember rolling around. There was a field exercise that we were doing and rolling around with. the with a rag and in sticks in a, in a Gatorade, you know, the ring, you know, when you pop the top off the Gatorade, that little, like little ring that sits on the bottle yeah. had like a bunch of those rings to, to like, to, uh, to hold down the windlass, basically the stick. And, uh, so we were using sticks and rags in a, in a Gatorade ring as a tourniquet. <laughs> yeah. Nuts. It, right. It, it innovative. <laughs> Yeah, and that's early two thousand five, right? So it's like, you know, and now and now like everybody everybody's rolling around with some type of tourniquet. Yeah. I think I mean I got two tourniquets in my truck, you know, like you can just Yeah, it's yeah, you never leave home without one, right? Yeah. When, especially you see obviously it can say it can save lives pretty quick in a traumatic event. Uh-huh. Dude, that's that's wild. Buds, uh how was how is Buds? Um it's a it's a, it's a, uh, man, like, I don't want to, I don't want to put any, uh, words in people's mouths, but it's a, it's like a circus. It's like a big circus and you just got to endure it, you know? Yeah. Um, and you know, fortunately for me, you know, I endured it to the point where I got injured, you know? 
Um, but um, it's an interesting it's an interesting school, and the reason why I say that is because it ne- it never that that school I remember it just like never stops. Like you get up at six o'clock in the morning and you keep moving until you know six, seven, eight o'clock at night, and then when you're at Hell Week, you just keep moving, keep go, keep go, keep go, keep go, keep one foot in front of the other. <laughs> like when does this thing stop? You know what I mean? It's <laughs> a grinder, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, we were talking beforehand. I know you can only go into so much detail, uh, especially with where you worked beforehand. But I was listening. It was like the Sean Ryan show with Chris Van Zant uh, and Kyle Morgan, kind of talking about that because those guys have similar backgrounds. Because like the SEAL community, I mean, there's documentaries on buds. There's TV show. I mean, books, everything on it. Secrets out. Yeah, like everyone kind of knows, and uh, you hear SEALs joke about, like, when they joined in the early 90s, late 90s, 2000s, like, there was nothing, right? There was, like, Charlie Sheen. Like, that was, like, the intel you had on Buds, and now, like, you know every single day what's going to happen and how it go through it. The the process for Green Berets and going to the unit Delta Force, not as well-known or documented, but can you compare those two, like, like, do those programs like parallel one another, or is it more like, hey, you, if you're going to the unit, obviously you still have to prove yourself. You're still being trained and going through things, but is it like the circus you can describe? Because having never done it, right? I, I feel like I understand what you're saying. Like, you watch a yeah. documentary on buds, and it's just people getting hit with fire hoses and yep. marching into the ocean. Yeah, is doing like the unit is that kind of same, or is it a different vibe? So. Yeah, I mean, there's they're diametrically opposed, and they do it. And each <laughs> one, in each one, does a great job of selecting the personnel that they're looking for, right? Um, they, you know, so in in buds, it's like everything is in your face, everything is performance based, uh, sort of. You just got to hang on. <laughs> yeah. You hang on, you can, you can kind of make it. Uh, well, I, you know, I never made it to second or third phase, so I'm, so I can't tell you, can't speak of that. But the during first phase, you know, in dock and first phase, everything is in your face. Um, they're not teaching you much. Like, it's more like, hey, you know, um, let's see if you can sink or swim, basically. You know what I mean? Um, and uh looking back that's like kind of like your selection that eight weeks of first phase or nine however long it is now that's like your that's your you're like hey do you deserve to be here type deal right um and they have their own they have their own method which is you know yelling <laughs> yelling at you and making you cold and wet and sandy and um sleep depriving you over a course of two months you know what i mean and yep so you know there's there's that end of it and you know keep in mind you know buds is only six months long okay um, total, and then you go off to seal qualifying training, and then and then you've got like team training and all this stuff. But that by that time, by the time you go to seal qualifying training, you're you've got to try to on your on your on your chest. Put you know when you graduate SQT, you got to try it. So not a big deal, right? But then um, uh, when you go to when you go to the Q course, this is the long haul, man. Like so, you're. You're not only asked to do a lot of physical things, you're also you're also asked to use your mind, your brain, um, and especially for eighteen deltas, you know that that haul can be up to three years Jeez. if you like. If you don't go, if you're not like a one time through kind of guy, I've seen guys be there for three years, right? So like I've been on a team for took me two years. I went straight through. Like I didn't I didn't recycle anything took me two years to do it. And, um, you know, I'll remember being at third group and be like, shit, man, I thought you, we got rolled out of there. He goes, no, you know, I had to recycle twice and this, that, and the other, you know what I mean? But, um, the, you know, those instructors are, are, um, you've got like two types of instructors, you know, in buds you have, every, <laughs> I remember in buds, I'm like, oh, man, there was always that one dude that you hated. <laughs> there's always that one you got yeah there's like the lover and the hug there's the hugger and the hater right yeah sorry baba could be quiet but um love it uh <laughs> sorry dude <laughs> uh 
Um, and then when you get to Q course, you have, you get assigned a cadre, right. For like a group, a group of you guys. And, um, that was kind of a Russian roulette. It was like, was it a guy who really didn't care what you did? Or was it a guy who was so control freakish about his students that he'd wake up at four 30 in the morning just to make sure that you went PT. You know what I mean? Yeah. And um, luckily for me, like throughout my my time in in the Q course, I had some pretty pretty really like really good Green Berets being my mentor, right? And um, they taught me a lot about they taught me a lot about uh about like what it is to be a good a good Green Beret and how and how how it d- differs from all the other soft forces and all this other stuff and um and like I said, like that's the long haul, right? So it was a little bit more of a it's not, I wouldn't call it a gentleman's course, but it was more professional. And then you get to the unit. So getting there is a very separating um, experience where you're, you feel like you're the, on your own island. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> but once you, once you get there and you go through, um, well, I went through a assault, assault medic course and then I went to OTC. Um, and both of those courses are, are very gentleman courses because you are there to learn. You're tr- you're there to learn their business. You're there to better yourself. You're there to um, to hone your craft and your skill. You know, um, and and the only limiting factor for you not making it across the hallway, so to speak, you know, you crossing the hallway is like getting out of OTC and going to a squatter, is um, is yourself. Like you can, you're the only one that can get in your in your own way. No instructor is going to get in your in your way, and uh, and they will, and they're they genuinely like, I I want to say they genuinely do they do care about their students. You know what I mean? Where they're like, we need this guy's invest this so much time in his a career and then b at this place, right? That he needs to um, we need to make sure if he can get it. And and the thing is like their standards are very strict. You know what I mean? Like you make one mistake and you make it again, you're probably blade running on getting out of there. You know what I mean? Like get, get out of there. Um, in, in OTC and also in squadron, you know what I mean? Like you slip on a wet booger out there in squadron, you better not do it again. You know what I mean? Um, it, so, I mean, as far as professionalism, it just, it climbs, you know what I mean? And getting to the unit, it's like, wow, this is what professionals, you know? So that's, that was my experience. That, uh, again, I've made, and I never went to weapon school. Right. But I can maybe draw a parallel with my buddies, you know, seeing where they were. So for a guy to go to weapon school, you know, they're an instructor pilot, right. They've been flying a jet for eight years. They've been teaching like they, they've proven themselves. Right. And then they go while, uh, it's not an, it's definitely not an easy course, but they're there to like learn to be the teachers that teach. Uh, and they put yeah. them through kind of a rigorous, yeah, a grueling, grueling six months to to get them on the other side. So that when they go back to a fighter squadron, they're the subject matter experts that, you know, they, they know it all. And if they don't know it, they'll find the guy who does and teach. But humble, approachable, credible, that's their mantra, right? That they, they go back to, to doing that. It's, it's, it's a, I know there's a lot, yeah, there's a lot in there. I have a lot of questions. I'll try to like cage it, but. Going back to the Q course, that's Green Beret selection, right? Yeah, that's selection and training, yeah. And like you said, that could, that was two years for you, and it could be upwards of, of three years. What was the process to get selected to be a Green Beret? I mean, I assume you're applying, right? You're being vetted by your leadership. They're looking at you, and they say, yeah, you're invited. Come on out. So you um, um, you go through selection. There's a selection process. Um, and I went through in 2010, September, I think, man, it's all blur kind of, uh, yeah, I think it's like 2000, September, 2010, October, August, I can't remember. It was somewhere in 2010. Um, they run, cause they run like two selections a year, right? Is that the, they run, well, no, they run like four or five. Okay. Yeah. The unit runs two. Okay. Year. Um, uh, and then you go to selection. So it's, it did it berries. I mean, I don't know what it is today, but I was, it was uh 27 days or 21 days 
you're out at Camp McCall and um, you do various things. So, you know, <laughs> the first <laughs> the first week is kind of like your stress week. You do log PT and you play games out in the field and they spray you down with hoses and all that other stuff, right? Um, then you go to land nav, right? And um, back then it was if you went five for five on the first day on the star course, you get to go back. What, and what's hand. that, five for five? So five points they give you. So if you can find all, find all five points within your within your hit okay. times, your um your go, and you can and you can go back to Camel Call and have some hot chow instead of eating MREs and standing by the fire, so to speak, you know. <laughs> and then the last last ten days or so is uh, Team Week, so you're you get paired up with with people and they give you different, you know. One example is they have you they give you like two barrels a bunch of poles, some lashing and like one flat tire and one full tire. And they go, you have to move this, these barrels, which are nuclear material across from this point to another point, which is about like, you know, I was looking on the map, like, fuck that's 10 K away. <laughs> and, and, uh, you have to do it in this amount of time and you've got 30 minutes to figure it out. And they make somebody a, a clap, you know, like the team leader, and an assistant team leader. And then you guys bounce off ideas and then you start making your thing. And then when the instructor says go, you start going, right? And then all they're doing is they're looking at how well you interact with people, how well you how well you play with, with others. Like like my son over here plays well with, with others, you know what I mean? Like, right. And and um, how, how calm, cool, collected you are, how confident you are in whatever decision you're going to make. You know? That whole thing, that whole the SF selection is is as much as the body as it is the mind. Um, cause they, they don't want a guy who's just going to go freaking out because his plan didn't work or he's a control freak or he's a micromanager. So, um, that's the selection. And then at the end of that, you know, you go in, um, to the, to the big hall and they tell you you're selected or not selected. And these are your strengths. These are your weaknesses. Um, and then this is your MOS that you're going to get. Basically, 18 Bravo, Charlie, Alpha, Alphas are the officers, obviously. And then, um, and then what your language is going to be. Well, so, uh, I would say it is funny too to hear of like, or I mean, I'm sure you see it. Like the guys you get thrown into a group with, but like you realize the scenario you're in, there's no good, there's no great solution, right? And it's always like there's an 80 percent solution, and it's not going to be perfect. Uh, and stuff's going to go wrong, but then like the meltdown, like some people will have, you're like, dude, all, like one, just make a decision, like own the decision, be a good dude, like work with people. Don't lose your mind. But it's amazing. They like, you get to the, like, yeah, do you see these very, I mean, it's the same, like, I don't know, copy and paste, like here, let's give a problem. There's no good answers. We're going to induce some stress and just see how people react, you know? And you got the one guy who has a meltdown. Yeah. One of them was like, uh, you had to push. I can't remember one or two jeeps, and they the jeeps didn't was missing a wheel in on like one of the sides, right? Then you had poles and lashings and stuff, right? And uh, and it, it you could steer it. Uh, and we were pushing this thing, and the leader was like just yelling at us. <laughs> I remember my buddy was like, he just had enough, and he goes, you know, shut the f, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. like dude. <laughs> Yeah, you know, and, um, you know, he didn't really know how to take it. He just kind of, he stopped yelling, he stopped giving, you know, um, command and control. And um, we missed our hit time because, because of that, you know what I mean? So um, it's, it, it's, uh, it, it definitely, it definitely, they definitely do a great job of, I don't know how it is now, but they did, they back then, they did a great job of selecting guys that had the aptitude to go to the Q course, you know, you know, are they, are they, do they work well with others? How is their mental aptitude? You know, um, uh, I just had one on the tip of my tongue, John. Whatever, I, if I remember it. Yeah, I'll, not I'll not an easy thing to go through. What was your language? My language is Urdu, spoken in Pakistan. Okay, which is inevitable to my home language, which is Hindi. <laughs> <laughs> those two get so, along so well i hear <laughs> yeah i know and i was like you gotta be kidding me right you know so uh, uh i can i could speak it 
I just couldn't write it. So I learned um, when I went to language school. I learned how to how to like how to write it basically. Okay. And I would practice with my teacher. Um, and I heard stories of guys like, "Oh, you're already in, you're already a native of that language. You can pass through language school and also the stuff." They asked me if I wanted to do that, and I said, "No, I don't, don't want to do that. I actually want to, you know, how to, how to write this stuff and be uh, not scholastic at it. I don't want to be a, I don't want to be an early scholar. But right. At least, you know, if I find myself in that country, which I did. <laughs> yes, yeah, shocking. Uh, um, I can, yeah, shocking. Right? <laughs> I can, I can, um, I can get by. You know what I mean? As far as uh, as a local, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't want to stick out as a as a guy who's a you know what I mean? Yeah, that's one thing yeah. that people listen might not fully uh, know. Like Green Berets, obviously special operations, but being a master in a language and a culture, and then going to embed with you know forces from that host nation, whichever you know your group or you're responsible for building that partner force. That's a big. That's a big aspect of it. I mean, that might even be the cornerstone. I'm speaking unintelligent, but can you talk to that a little bit? Like why? Why the Green Braves? Why is that such an important thing? And how does that work? So um, they're different from all other special operations because um, the uh, the key the key difference is the the unconventional warfare ability, right? So now everybody's saying we can do unconventional warfare, but um, I I full heartedly disagree because it's um, it's not taught in some of these programs. You know what I mean? Uh, we we're taught how to do this stuff, and then we when we further our further our skill set when we get to group. And the other thing is being able to go into any set country and speak the language, and also be culturally culturally aware of what's going around them. Right. So um, if you look at the old like Vietnam Green Berets, right, um, and then some of the like the eighties and nineties. So they, you know, they were involved a lot of, with a lot of low intensity conflicts. So if your, your, your viewers or your listeners aren't, aren't, aren't uh, familiar with low intensity conflict is us was involved with a lot of those things and green berets were part, of it, right? So just look up what low intensity conflict means. And you can start looking at some stuff around the world of like geopolitically or what the U S was all about back then. Um, and that's what made, Green Berets so successful on the ground in Afghanistan, I think. You know what I mean? They knew how to link up with the so quote unquote so called G Chief, kind of assuage his his uh, <laughs> his uh, his uh, ego. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and, and or massage his ego to do uh, not only what the the you know to convince him basically it's good for us and good for you. You know what I mean? Yep. Um, and that's that's the that's the major difference. You know. Um, you know, direct action and special reconnaissance and all that stuff aside, what makes what makes a Green Beret a Green Beret is the ability to do all professional warfare and speak a language. Yeah. That's a that's a it's a, a key a key component, you know. And I venture to say not knowing anything, uh, or insider knowledge, but today you just look at the world environment, you know, if we're pivoting towards like near peer threats in China. I, you know, Brazil just ditched the dollar agreement with China. Several other South American countries, Africa, uh, you know, China's all in Africa. It's almost like the Cold War days where you're trying to influence, you know, these not not necessarily all third world countries, but countries that are up and coming or that have needs where they look to a superpower to come in and, you know, build roads or, you know, give kickbacks and to corrupt leaders and arms and all sorts of stuff. But having it's so important in my opinion, and again, not being a strategist, but to have U S representation out there vying and making sure we have good relationships, uh, yep. working with government militaries throughout the world. And I think that's gonna be even, you know, in the next 10 years, like the landscape landscape is changing and we're going back to kind of the bipolar, uh, war or world where you had, you know, the U S and the Soviet union now, you know, U S and is it China? Like I think probably most people would venture to say, yep. And now it's so important to be in all these little countries. Yeah. I mean, um, where, I mean, it, the, the history speaks for itself, right? I mean, uh, you know, JFK, whether you liked him or hated him, you know, it doesn't really matter to me, but you know, he created the SF like branch basically in the army 
and he pulled it away from the CIA, the office, the OSS, and, and brought it over into the military DOD side of the house because he realized that, that we are, are, are the, you know, we didn't have that capability, that force to be able to go into another country. And, and, and you know, they say by, with, and through, but it's more like, you know, um, linking up with, with indigenous personnel, training and equipping them for not only their own personal defense, but also for the U.S.'s strategic, global, political uh, needs. You know what I mean? And, you know, the day we go away from that, I believe, uh, is the day that we lose a big, big piece of, you know, just like you're saying, where we're China is starting to not infringe because it is a free world. It's a free world and they can do whatever they want. But right. um, uh, they're, they're starting to, to kind of like dip their, dip their spoon in the pot, so to speak, you know what I mean, as far as uh, influencing different countries. And obviously they're going to go to the countries that are the weakest, right? First. Yeah. Well, it's, I mean, yeah, you, know, you say, I say China, right? Like we do the, I mean, we're doing the exact same thing. We've always done the exact same thing. Like we just want to, we want to be number one and keep doing that. And by yeah. China doing that, like that, now you, all right, hey, the U.S. gets knocked out of the, the number one seat, if you will. And there's ramifications economically, et cetera. Um, but yeah. So we, I mean, we do the, we do the exact same thing. Oh, hundred percent. But we didn't have any competition. Yeah. Yeah. We were, we were just winning it. The funny, <laughs> the one aspect from my demo days, right. Doing air shows of all, all things like the strategic level impact of that. I did not realize, but I did an air show in Rio Negro, Colombia. And, uh, the day I was flying, you know, there's a lot of, there's, obviously it's open to the public, but the Colombian Secretary of Defense, their Secretary of the Air Force, their Chief of Staff of the Air Force, and the you know, entourage of like 30-plus people. Everybody. Came out to watch to fly, right? Because you know, we're trying to get the Colombians to buy F-16s. Having interoperability, and we see that with the F-35 today, like having nations that are all flying the same fighter for interoperability is an important piece. But you, you know, obviously, you're, you're, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of things that are benefits when you go down that road. Um, but, That's right. But partnering with these nations and having a good relationship and building that relationship. It's multifaceted. And I think it is, it is really, um, really important if, you know, we want to stay, stay number one. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I mean, it's uh it's, it's a, it's a, it's a huge piece of the pod. Like, yeah, totally agree with you, you know, and, and it's, huh, it's, a, it's a, We've been practicing it for a long time, yeah. so <laughs> we should be pretty damn good at this, right? Yeah, we should. Uh, we should be. We, yeah. I mean, that's, we say we should, right? Yeah, right. Uh, and, but unfortunately, you know, the the men and women in the uniform today are are just as well equipped and and well trained to do it. It's just whether or not they're allowed to. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, 100%. yeah, politics and all those things those trickle down and impact from the strategic level all the way down to the tactical level. We actually right. didn't see it. Your time as a, a Green Beret. Um, talk to me a little bit about that. How how was how are those years? That was that was pretty fun, man. I um I got my wish with with being a Green Beret. You know, I had I had a good um like I said, I had good mentors in in um in the Q course and learned about unconventional warfare and all this other stuff. And so, um my my first deployment was just like a basic visit village stability operation in Afghanistan. Um, my second deployment though was really cool because I was it was a singleton singleton mission out to the Central Asia sh- Central Asia states to um, to kind of track and um, hunt Taliban financiers basically right and and see how that how that um, how that money was getting funneled outside of the country back into Afghanistan to fund their fund their war against the United States basically. You know what I mean? That's wild. In in our in our allies, you know. And so um I started in Tajikistan and then made my way via vehicle into Uzbek and then <laughs> uh made my way in into via vehicle into Kyrgyzstan. Um I've I've been to the Gordon Balaksh, Balaksha Oblast province, whatever, which is the eastern border 
of Tajikistan in the southern, in the northern border of Afghanistan. So we're talking Hindu Kush Mountain Silk Road. Yeah. I've driven that in a, no in a Toyota Land Cruiser <laughs> um, with a broken header, just sounding like, <laughs> uh, I've touched the China border, you know, I went to Pakistan. That was a good nine months. That was really um, an eye opening and fun um, nine month deployment. So I was all alone um, collecting uh, information Dude. for the United States. Here's the funny part, right? To me, I hear uh, it sounds epic until you have to do your travel voucher uh, post deployment of. Holy shit, dude. <laughs> the, that that the... travel voucher post deployment. I mean, I can't tell you how many times it got it got kicked back to me. Yeah. Right. And um, uh, luckily, I had some I had some good leadership that kind of stood up for me, and they were like, "No, no, you don't understand. This guy was just." He just did this, this, and this, and yeah. he was part of this program and that program, and and uh, eventually it got <laughs> kicked through. But my wife was like, "You know, we have like forty thousand dollars worth of bills here." <laughs> right? Yeah. So I was like, "This sounds epic," and I can only imagine the uh, the person behind the computer that was like, "No, yeah, that doesn't have a receipt for this. Nah, we don't go there. You can't do that." You know, like, dude. Um, oh, he's like not even our mission set. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, right. Uh, he, Hey, thing. I didn't just go here because it was fun. I didn't go to Uzbekistan because yeah, yeah. I was like, hey, this is nice. What? So when you're doing one of those singleton out there, obviously you're developing human contacts, doing all sorts of stuff. Um, I imagine you're doing a lot of intergovernment crosstalk, potentially like a feeding off one another. Yep. What? Um, can't have, I'm super, again, I was trying to like not go down the, a rabbit rabbit hole that we can't come back out of, but we'll send it. Let's go. I'll see. Yeah. The, do. um, day in the life of man, like how did you start that process? So you get dropped off, you drive across the border, but then you're trying to integrate into these networks and find these people. Like, how did that, you, I know there's pre-study and there's probably some, you know, handoffs, yeah. but dude, like day one, like just to how to get started. Cause you, know, I think go TDY to a school, right? Like, just getting getting on base and if even get a rental car or taxi like that's the pain of the air force like how do i get on base from a an uber uh, because i can't get a <laughs> so rental car I, you know how so i get across the border it was yeah like dude i can't get a rental car authorized on dts orders for like a you know three month tdy but like hey go go do this you're going here like how does that even start so um i had a i had a guy uh that was in that seat for about a year um and he was kind of home based at a at a Dushanbe in, in Tajikistan, and he he uh, he kind of gave me a, like a really good handover of of some information and also some things that he was looking at. But um, he never really he, he never really uh, he had he had uh, he had uh, he did his like area studies and map studies and cultural studies and also stuff, but he never didn't have time to follow through, and so. I was looking at all the stuff that he was kind of managing and juggling. And I said, and I talked to my, and uh, you know, fortunately I had a, I had a really good, I had a really good commander that was there. That was kind of like the two I see of the dat. And I said, Hey man, I'm going to dump all this stuff that requires me to be here at the embassy because my mission says this, right. Um, and then, uh, I had, you know, you have, you also have your directive from, from upstairs right so like those two things have to match and then what i mean by upstairs is uh, agency stuff so it's like those things have to match and then you go and execute and there's oversight on two sides so you have your dod and the, and the agency oversight where they're like okay you're not meeting the goals or meeting the goals. put them both together in a room and i said hey man if i if you want me to be just if you want me to just hang out here you know in tajikistan and not do anything and just be a body i can do that but that's not what I'm here for, right? This is what I'm here. I'm here to do this, that, and the other. And they were like, okay, go ahead and execute, right? And so I had all this stuff that he, that uh, that Dave had, had, had handed down to me. And um, and so I just started following up, man, right? So like the first one was like, how porous is the Uzbek border, right? Uh, turns out it's really porous. So all you yeah. need is some Shocking. fire cutters and yeah. Oh, you need some wire cutters and you can drive a vehicle right through it. You know, um, 
how porous is the Kurdi border? Border, pretty porous. You know what I mean? How porous is the Afghan border to the Tajik border? Not that porous, right? There's only two two places that you can cross cross the Pond River, and and uh, yeah, there's and their and their border security is is pretty robust. Now, um, then it's like, well, how how is how is black tar heroin getting out of the country? You know what I mean? And so it's like all these questions that were being asked that never got answered. I was just trying to answer them. That's all. And um, so you know that's that's how it all how it all started. And then and then it started. You know that that was a slow trickle for about two months, John. And then um, after after I started answering these questions, I'd go to these places and meet people. And my Russian got pretty darn good. And um, and I would start speaking a little Sputnik to them and the, uh, <laughs> uh, they'd be like, oh, this guy's all right, you know, and I wasn't a white dude, which I think really kind of dis- disarmed them, you know what I mean? And yeah. uh, and then they would be like, yeah, we see mules coming across at this time of day or this time of year, or this, that, and the other, and that would give me more information to go back to do a surveillance or whatever it may be, right? So met people to get like a good layout of the land as far as... Um, uh, of how nefarious activities kind of uh, start and all that stuff, and and um, and so yeah, I mean th- that nine months that was pretty darn busy. It was busy. In that time, good- yeah, I was like in that time period. Did you? I, can you talk about how how does that money? How does black tar heroin make it out of Afghanistan? You know, onto the streets of U.S. How does that money make it back? Like, how is that beneficial? I mean. Think of just shipping something from one part of the world to the next with FedEx or whatever is <laughs> yeah. f- fairly easy. But to get you know illicit drugs out of Afghanistan and then money back into the the Taliban, how does that work? So the the um uh, in my in my experience the um the it goes one of two ways. So they make the opium in Afghanistan. They package it. And they ship it north to your Tajik, <clears throat> not a porous border, but if you have enough money, you can adjust the water patrol guys, right? The the yeah. national security guys. Um, because those guys are hard up for money anyway. The Tajik government isn't paying them very much money. From there, you have pretty much free reign of driving it to wherever you want to. Um, they have, they have, various airfields um across central asia where they can then ship it off to the middle east and there it gets distributed through the middle east throughout the world how the money comes back um, i find myself in dubai <laughs> um and that and that's where your money gets exchanged right it changes currency from the u.s dollars um to either you know Chinese rubbing rubbing bee or it, it changes hands to their, to rupees, right? Um and then gets shipped back into Afghanistan. How it gets shipped back into Afghanistan is they take a rat line through a truck and go back from Tajik down into into northern Afghanistan, Mazar Sharif in those areas. Um another way it goes is through Pakistan. So Pakistan's an easy one. Um I'm I don't want to put a target on my back here, but uh, <laughs> the Pakistani government isn't um, as forthright as we would want them to believe that they are, you know, and a lot of the government officials are involved with that mind laundering. Yeah, I mean, overtly, right? I think we might have or might not have seen that with Osama bin Laden, right? So everyone knows that story. But, you know, I, I remember being in Afghanistan. Again, I had first world problems compared to what you're dealing with, but it, I, it was a time period we had uh, a couple of cast incidents and then uh, we were also intrusion. You know, we'd have an aircraft overfly the Pakistani border by, you know, a hundred meters. And at that point they shut the border down, which was how we we're getting, you know, all the supplies to Bagram and Kandahar and all, you know, all the logistics. Um, and so, you know, it was, a, it was a hardship time there where you couldn't get all the supplies and fuel in the base was, I mean, just a pain. Um, so yeah, it's not necessarily like I'm always a, super great and uh no i easy mean working relationship 
No, it's it's a it's a it's it's a terrible relationship in um in in it we can't say that we did it. You know what I'm saying? Right, right, yeah, it's, yeah, that's on them, yeah, man. You know what yeah, I mean? And right. And uh yeah, we, <laughs> it's totally on them and it's like why why uh why why are we trying to be friends with these people in the first place when they're so corrupt? Sorry, I'm trying to put this watch on this. No, there you I, go. I get... You're ready. Um and it's it's like uh yeah, they're they're it, the Pakistani government is it's not they're not great people. That's for sure. Yeah. Any, um you know, there's there's a there's a myriad of things that I've seen like, you know, when black tar heroin is in, in season because it is there's a season for it what are they doing and they're shipping off humans to make money you know what i mean and so there's you know we all we all want to talk about war and all this other stuff but the the great injustice is that like we we aren't controlling the humanity you know what i mean that's that's coming in out of that country and think about it now i mean shoot dude we're not there any longer right and it's gone gone to the way we're um, I, I was having a, a, a conversation with a friend of mine who, a, a former unit member, member of mine, and we were just talking about like Afghanistan and how, like, how do we quantify all all the things that happened in the last two years, right? With us leaving in 2021 in August, you know, people clinging to the to the uh, to the uh, the you know the landing pod the, the landing gear of of the C-17, and it's it's like. He, he equated it to this, and this is kind of a good one. It's like, it's like an apple, right? You eat the apple, right? So this is like, while you're in country, you eat the apple, it's delicious, right? You're done with the apple, and you throw it away. And the thing is, it is what it is. It's not, it's not like, uh, I know guys, other guys who, t- who took it really, really personally. And it's like, yeah, I, I, I get it. I get what you're, what you're trying to, what you're trying to say, and, but don't let that identify you. You know what I mean? That, that was a job in a different country that you were, called to do you know what i mean yep so and it's um yeah i mean it's uh it but you think about it now like how much human trafficking is going on and that's kids you know what i mean astronomical amounts you know what i mean i i can't i mean it's unfathomable to like even think about it. so one if i ever think i'm having like a bad day i also just like perspective wise like there's some people who are having really bad days in afghanistan but even traveling you know if you go to dubai if you go to bahrain uh, you see like the people who are working on the streets or in the hotels, like services, a, a lot of them, when they're going home at night, like they're not living in great condition. They're there. I mean, essentially indentured servitude. I venture to say probably for, for most of them. And well, those, those really... guys are, those guys are, um, I got to talking to some of those kind of service guys in, in yeah. Dubai. They spent, I spent a little bit, I mean, not a little bit, I spent a lot of time in Dubai trying to chase the money type stuff. And the people that are building all the buildings there and doing in the service industry, you know, anybody who's been to Dubai, you know, it's all hotels and stuff like that. You can't buy an alcoholic drink outside of town, but in the hotel, you're cool. Right. Um, uh, those people, they get they get uh, sold a bill of goods. Like, hey, you want to make money for your family? Come on over here. We'll, we'll give you money. Well, they take their passports right away. So they're not allowed to leave. Like how the hell do you leave without a passport? You know yeah, what I mean? You're stuck. You're stuck. And um and there's no end at sight. You know what I mean? So it's you know, there that's just <laughs> that's the way it is, man. I mean we're fortunate enough to live in the United States where we can roam free and still That's very true, right? I have uh I interviewed Ed Caldron. His episode hasn't released yet. It'll release before this, but yeah, Ed. He was a. Uh, he's the drug guy, right? Yeah, drug yeah. So he, he fought, yeah, fought cartels right down in Mexico. Now he's doing a bunch of survival and uh, things like that up here in the states. But he brought up a good point too. It's like, you know, like COVID, right? Like we still had lettuce, we still had fruit and vegetables showing up. I mean, it's the same. The same deal is happening with people who are trying to get across the border, and then all of a sudden they find themselves like they're indentured, indentured servitude. They're slaves. They're stuck working in the fields because they paid some coyote or some, you know, someone to get them across the border. Right. Like, man, they, they have no options. It's just, it's a lot of bad stuff that happens out there. I mean, it, that's the, that is the, yeah, that's just the way it is, man. I mean, it's not, I'm not going to, it meant maybe it sounds crass to me, 
crass to, to people, but it, I am not going to lose any sleep over it. It's, um, you know, um, that's just the way the world has worked for eons. You know, since the millennia, since the beginning of time, this is how it's been. And yep, there's um, no change in it. I, uh, we're just, we're just better equipped with stuff like this. You know what I mean? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we don't have runners any longer, you know? <laughs> you know? Yeah. hundred percent valid. Yeah. So man, that's, that's pretty interesting time. So you did two deployments as Green Beret and then you ca- you came back and then did you get invited to selection or did you apply or like, I, um, I, uh, opened my, e- my inbox one day in, um, and I don't know if it's a mass email or whatever, but it was like, Hey, there's a, there's a union out there that would, that, uh, that would let, would that, that has the opportunity for you to go in and try it. And I kind of put it on the wayward, and this is like 2000, let's see, 2000, this is 2015, okay? And my contract ended in 2017. And uh, Julia, my wife, Julia, was like, well, what are you, you going to do? And I said, I'm going to do one of two things. I'm either going to go to this unit or I'm getting out to play golf, right? And she goes, okay. So I put my packet in to go over over there. It gets accepted. I go to selection, and I get hired. Um. Uh, let's back up for a second here. I went to selection, and uh, the I was at the board, and they were like, "Well, you know, thanks for coming in, but we're not going to hire you." And I said, "Okay, that makes my decision like easy." Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I was like shaking everybody's hand. I'm like, "Thanks, see you later," you know. And, uh, and I get a call that was like, I think it was a Thursday or a Friday or whatever. And then I, I, uh, I'm sitting back at the third group company office and I get a phone call. My, uh, company star major, Chris Ramsey gets a phone call on his phone. He's like, Bresh, you got a, you got a phone call here. And I was like, who is it from? <laughs> he was, I don't know. It was some Sergeant major, right? So I answered the phone and it was, um, Sergeant major Scott Brian. And he goes, hey, we'd actually like to hire you. <laughs> <laughs> what changed? You know what I mean? You're, and so anyway, I took the job and and, uh, and it went on over there. And um, I cleared, I think I cleared posts because at that point, you know, when you're when you're in that kind of a secretive unit, you have to clear posts and all this stuff. I, th- I think I cleared posts in like three days. <laughs> and got out of there. <laughs> yeah, they cut me orders within like 24 hours. I had orders over there and then I... um. I I cleared posts for like three days and then I was over over there. I was over the fence, so to speak. So what was the two experiences like that you can talk about? Uh can you compare the two or just completely different? Like to me, roaming around as a singleton through Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, um, that that seems pretty pretty wild. I imagine you're still doing some of that stuff. You're also doing some of the direct direct action type things. What what it, was it like? It is um that place did a great job of allowing anybody who had the experience to, to express their prowess in that experience. If that, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Um, there was, there was no, no holding back, you know, like we talk about risk aversion in the military, especially on the ground force side, you know, like we're not going to do that cause we're risk adverse and we don't want, um, people dying unnecessarily and all sort of stuff. But, uh, the unit understood and still understands this day how dangerous that job is in that, um, in that bad things can happen. Right. And, it, and it's okay. You know what I mean? A, a learn from it and B, you know, how, do, how do we, how do we evolve as a, as a fighting force? It is the, it is the place that evolves so fast and so efficiently. I've never seen it before. Like as a, an organization, it's like an organism, you know what I mean? Um, I think it, it might have been Chris Van Zant when he was on Sean the Sean Ryan show that I was listening to. He was talking about going through one of the training evolutions and a guy blew his hand off. Um, yeah, yeah, that happens with, all the time. Well, not all. Dead, the- yeah, but it happened, and you know, like he compares like regular army. And I said, you know, like regular if like stand down, we're not doing anything else for the rest of the day, tomorrow, and the next day while we investigate it. And his thing was just like. All right, next team up. What I mean, it's just like keep moving through it, you know. Was he an OTC at the time or something? I think when he was describing, I need to go back and listen to it. But he was going through 
the training cycle. So OTC right. is uh, the operator training course, right? That's right. Yeah. And so I, I think that's when it was, and I might be mistaken, but he was just like, yeah, yeah. all right, next evolution, you know, next team up, you know, it, it happens. I mean, I, I was, I've never been, I've never been around um, breaching accidents, but um, I've, I've had buddies that, that have been, and it's like, you know, uh, it's like, all right, well, he's off at the hospital and who's, who's going to be the next guy. <laughs> it's, yeah. It's, <laughs> next um, yeah ne- yeah next and it um it's uh it's yeah uh, like i said like the organization as a whole is i looked at it as an organism and it would always change the whole thing and it was always changing it never regressed it was always progressing some for some reason and somehow the stars aligned for that place it always it always uh it always uh it always moved forward and you know, so going back to your question about, you know, what was it like between me at Green Beret and being a, an, an SF guy in, in the unit? Um, I did a lot more direct action in the unit, um, but I also did a lot of singleton stuff as well, right? Um, which I was comfortable with because I'd already done it. Yeah. Um, so that was like the margin of my experience. You know what I mean? It, it's like... Um, I hadn't done any direct action since like 2008 when I was with our first force, you know what I mean? And, um, like I really hadn't, I had gone to like some CQB schools and then you go to OTC, which is like, is like the most professional CQB school you could ever go to. Right. Which is, you know, that's the meat and potatoes of it, but not to include all the other stuff that you do there, but. Um, I did a lot of direct action. I did a lot of, a lot of singleton stuff. I also, I also did a lot of like unconventional medicine. If you, if you know what I'm saying, like, um, um, uh, like, uh, not, you know, like everybody hates the term CBRN, whatever medicine it was. There's like, there's cutting edge stuff that we were working on there to help save mass amounts of lives and just in case something were to happen if we were going to a near peer threat, you know? And at that point in time, there was, there was one particular country that was on, on the, uh, on the docket as near peer. We were pretty sure that we were gearing up to go both there. I think, um, I don't know if we can talk about that again. This is a lot of, I don't know if we can talk about it. Maybe we can, maybe we can't. I think you and I, we had some overlap like Syria time frame, or maybe your one deployment, cycle after I was because I was there the the basically the opening volley of Operation Inherent Resolve. Yeah. So I spent a lot of time up in Kabani. Um yeah. and talking via satellite to I think some of your brethren back back here stateside. Yeah. While they were helping with the YPG. And then you know, at that time we had not touched Raqqa yet. We would if we dropped all our bombs in Kabani, then we you can go supersonic you're point nine five limited in the Viper with bombs on your jet. Uh-huh. But if we if we cleared the rails and we'd go back over Raqqa supersonic just to let them know that we're we're coming for we're, them next. We're coming for you. Yeah. And um so okay. that is uh and an interesting time frame. I actually remember too the the Russians when they started lobbing cruise missiles into Syria. And you know, we would actually get a Link 16 track. The surveillance radars would, would throw it, and we'd see it, and then you could you know, actually lock it up with the targeting pod and see these cruise missiles coming over yeah. uh, into yeah. Syria. And then, obviously, they started moving their fighters and their forces in there, which changed the dynamic because of the onset of it. We didn't know if Assad, what he was going to do, right? He basically owned the western half. There was a Bino line. That's right. ISIS had everything else, or it was no man's land. But they had a it was a Dar's War out there in the east. They had um, like an SA six site, and then they would have like some Su twenty fives. And so every now and then we call it the superpower lane. We'd be blasting directly south, like through the middle part of the country. Yeah. And they'd have like a Su twenty five, which would launch out of Dar's War, going back to the the motherland on the west coast, like the safety. And they either those guys were completely unaware we were there. But you're just kind of navigating this. Like, is he showing awareness? Do they, you know, do they not? Do they, you know, there's some <laughs> interesting missions where, like, hey, there's a certain point, like, escorting B ones here. If they launch, and they even turn and point their nose at it, the B ones are inside a weapons engagement zone. Like, it, you know, does that meet hostile intent, hostile act? You know, just right. showing awareness, and you, you know, sling an AMRAM and start World War Three. But the Russians showed up, right? And then the Russians zipping around there, and then we got Raptors flying around. 
it's an interesting time period. And Assad using chemical weapons, uh, dude, wild time. Where, what? When were you there? Um, I Can was you... there 2000. Let's see, hold on, sorry. I was there 2000, end of 2000, mm-hmm. oh, sorry, beginning of 2017. I was there uh, middle of 2017. I was there. I was there in 18, and my last time was there was 19. Yeah, so I guess 20, because like Raqqa, like the assault and taking Raqqa back, and that was that 2016 or 2017? I mean, that ISIS held. That was 27. That was 2017 because I was I was on a a special task force with the unit, uh, and the other the other half of the squadron was already making their push down to to Raqqa. Like a good friend of mine still has pictures of him. At the su- the center, the circle, yeah, him and his buddies all taking photos. Dude, uh, they had pushed all the that, that whole offensive down. It's wild to think that it was like two years later. Um, when I first showed up, it was like Vice News. Ironically enough, they did like an hour long documentary riding around with ISIS, and I thought it was really well done. But they're riding around like with ISIS, like public affairs officer through Raqqa and, you know, they're showing yeah, everything they're doing in Raqqa. And then, you know, obviously you, you see really what's happening and it takes two years to get to that assault. But to me, that was interesting. It was an interesting uh, deployment. It was different than uh, Afghanistan and even Iraq too, where, you know, this big bureaucracy machine had built up. Yep. Um, and in that time period, it hadn't. I mean, my first drop was literally a data message to go smack a target, which is something that, you're like this, yeah. You know, we plan for like World War Three. Like it real? this is, yeah. So yeah, and then uh, next one was like anything that's not inside this block. If it is an individual or a truck or any kind of vehicle, kill it, destroy it. Don't talk yeah. to anyone. Just destroy it. And you're like, yep, yeah. This is wild times. It's this, it uh, was it was a it's an interesting it was an interesting um deployment in the fact that or deployments, you know, like these. 17, 18, those years were really, really interesting. 17 in particular, because it was a show of what we could do as a, as DO, like DOD without any bureaucracy. Like, hey, weapons hot, everything free, go. This is your mission, right? And it was pretty clear, right? It wasn't, we weren't fighting an insurgency. We were, we were fighting like an organized, organized, you know, roughly organized enemy and it was and it was uh pretty 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 cool to to be on the front lines of that you know what i mean and um uh it was very very efficient it was unbelievably efficient couldn't believe how efficient that's what you know I, i've actually said it too so that deployment for us we the bureaucracy or the pain with ops and maintenance in a fighter squadron is usually kind of a pain, right? Like maintenance is always trying to, they never, like you'll have, you go out there, there's 20 jets sitting on the ramp. You're supposed to fly 12 that day. Two of them break. You're like, well, I just want to take another one, right? But maintenance is like preserving the life of the jet over time. They're also managing man hours. But like when deployed, two emerged, singularly focused on the mission. So whatever it takes to get things done, like the bureaucracy, the PowerPoint slides, they still exist, but they're minimized in the efficiency tends to ramp up but the it's it how seemed, do you think it, it kind of seemed like a lot of the things that would hold you up in the uh, in an afghanistan or maybe in OEF uh, OEF deployment or whatever uh didn't didn't hold us up when we were we were, we were pushing at the flot you know what i mean and yeah and it was it was cool to see that those you know that those kind of restrictions were lifted you know what i mean they're like hey hey man go and smash these dudes yeah i had uh general holmes on the podcast who was the air combat commander uh up until he retired in 2020 and that was one of the questions like i asked him and he was like the bureaucracy right because the bureaucracy was one of those things that was really painful to me i had a really smart boss much smarter than me but he's like dude he goes my opinion is the air force wants like a six or a seven like if you're operating at an eight nine or ten level you're the guy who's going to challenge the system and push the boundaries. Like, that's dumb. Why are we doing that? They don't want you. I'm like a five. So I'm like, Hey, we'll, we'll hang on to you for a little bit. <laughs> but he, his thing was like, Hey, 
you know, Afghanistan, we got so worried that one civilian casualty would land on the page of New York Times, front page of New York Times, and it would completely change, you know, the way the world thought, the way the world acted with regards to us. And that's that's what drove everything. I remember listening to some of my buddies on the radio who in Afghanistan, you know, they're reading which ROE they're dropping under. They're reading, you know, confirm your cutoff surrounded. No means of escape, you know, imminent threat of being overrun. You know, I mean, they were lawyers on the radio as part of like the nine line to confirm that they could drop. And you're like, right. what are we doing here? Yeah, exactly. And maybe with I- I- ISIS, everyone saw how horrific that that group was. Yeah. Uh, and then you kind of knew it wasn't embedded in a village where maybe this dude's Taliban. Mm-hmm. Maybe he's not, you know. And if you were anywhere in this area in Syria, you were a bad dude, like, or you should have gotten out of there. It just or associated like it was... with a bad dude. Those, I don't think people understand, you know, we forget so quickly, but like, I don't, I don't think people realize like what kind of human beings we were dealing with at the time, you know, in the, in that era. And, um, there's a, there's a, you, you remember, so, you know, Kobani and the LCF, right? Yeah. So you know those cement silos? Yeah. Okay. Do you know the story behind that? No. So when when the unit and like special forces and some rangers and stuff were making an assault pushing down towards Kobani, LCF was was like the place that they were gonna be like this is a ISIS it was a ISIS stronghold at the time. A perfect place, you know what I mean? And what they were doing was taking uh, men, women, children, and particularly like men who were uh, conscientious, conscientious like ISIS objectors, or they thought were gay, right? They take them, march them up to the top of those silos, and push them off. So when those guys got to that place, there was a mountain. Of dead bodies. Jeez. You know what I mean? And th- this is the kind of people we were dealing with. You know what I mean? So that, if that's a snapshot of what kind of hor- horrific things you can see, you know what I mean? I mean, these, those, those people were doing it. You know what I mean? That's like, that's coming out of a horror movie, man. You know what I mean? So, um, but you know, how easily we forget of how, how, shitty we can be to each other <laughs> it's like it's man yeah. <laughs> you know it's, yeah we, we, it's, we it's forget wild. this so so fast and it's like for guys like you and i you know and those things kind of stick to you and then you're like okay we be a nicer person these to at least now that i'm not carrying a gun and a badge and walker you know what i mean dude yeah it's i mean those that's just like scratching the surface i yeah, we had a Jordanian pilot that got shot down while while we were there. And, yeah, uh, that's the dude that we, got burned. Yeah, I mean, did you see uh, the video? Yeah, I saw the video. It's ugly. Oh, yeah, hor- hor- horrific. Uh, yeah, yeah, you know, they probably marched him a thousand or a hundred times doing a mock execution, and then they finally you know lit him on fire. But it's like that's the that's the type of people you're dealing with, and you hear all the story with the Yazidi women and um, dude. Bad, bad, bad stuff. So maybe that helped uh, rip the gloves off a little bit and let you guys operate and remove the the bureaucracy and the red tape that usually flows with it. You know, it's it's funny. After I had met you, um, Justin, Alf, yeah, he linked me up with a guy who actually dropped bombs for us. Really? Yeah, in two thousand seventeen. I'm trying to think there was if, if we go with the, if you give me the months later, um, when we get off the podcast, cause you know, that was a cycle, especially at Shaw, like every, it was like bounce between F 16 units, you know, us and then like Masawa, then back to Shaw every six months, just kind of cycling and then mixing Spangdalem in there as well. But, um, dude, that was like, that was busy time. Like, we we dropped the most precision guided weapons of any F sixteen unit when we showed up, and then that record was beat the next time, and then the next squadron beat it, and, <laughs> and then, then the, the next, next squadron beat it. Yeah, it just like 
dude, it just kept going and going. Like we have this picture of our bomb wall. I mean, it's filled, you know, from waist high all the way up to the ceiling. He's like, you know, 14, 15 foot high ceilings. And, uh, do they just, I mean, they painted over it and just did it again. And then they just did it again. Um, it's amazing. I remember taking, I took off one night we took off the last, uh, GB 38s and GB 54s like on base. Like we took off nothing. We dropped it. And then when we landed, they were getting more bomb bodies and kits dropped off of base. But we were just plowing, plowing through it. You guys were, you, you guys were clearing the rails. Yeah. <laughs> so, turn and turn and burn, right? You know, like yeah, it was uh, it was impressive to see the efficiency because again, I think that all started with our weapons officer getting called from a guy up at Bragg said, "Hey, yeah, you know, I need you to come up here uh, tomorrow or the next day." And you know that that was kind of the the start of how we we got spun up, and then you know fast forward four weeks later, then we're in it and and dropping the one the one joke too. I, I did participate in a couple of VTCs. Um, I went down to Djibouti a little bit. And so the VTCs are happening. A guy's calling in from, you know, all these different outstations around the world. Yeah. But short sleeve, button down plaid shirt, 5'11", like tactical pants or whatever pants, you know, it's like everyone looked the same, you know? Yeah. So. A little beard. Yeah, beard, <laughs> beard, short sleeve plaid shirt, man. Yeah. Uh, out there, there's a lot of a lot of good dudes doing some uh, important work out there, so. Yeah, um, the hats off to it, man, like, um, uh, you know, we wouldn't be, we wouldn't be safe without those guys in, in like the, the key players, you know what I mean? I'm not saying that I'm not downplaying uh, anybody who's serving right now or any of that other stuff, but, um, I'm only speaking from my own experience of how important it is to have fellows like yourself and fellows like the guys that I used to work with, um, still doing the good, good fight, you know what I mean? And, um, they're in harm's way a lot these days you know what i mean but it's uh it turned to a low intensity conflict type stuff if you know what i'm saying yeah well 100 percent. and that's i get people to ask me um you know th there's a lot of stuff in the news today and the media of like how the military is going and wokeism and yada 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 uh, and there's a lot of that right there's a lot of noise um i think but and like well there's no way we'd we'd win a fight i do give a lot like a lot of buddies who are still doing it a lot of guys who are uh, much smarter than me, much more talented than me. And that's what gives me confidence. Cause I know they're standing, they're still standing on the wall. And like, if the flag goes up and there's complex problems to solve, like I know the guys who are out there, they're going to go do it. And I'll, I'll be the high speed cheerleader on the sideline saying, yeah, go get them and <laughs> yeah, go throw them a it, water man. bottle. Uh, but yeah, they, <laughs> the pom poms. Yeah. Like you guys are great. They're uh, yeah. some really, really good dudes and dudettes that are, they're still doing that. I have a lot of faith in. Hey, I want to pivot real quick okay. because we've, we've touched a little bit um, on it. Playing golf now. Like, dude, the fact that yeah. one uh, engineer, which I didn't even ask this too. Like, I imagine being in the unit, uh, your engineering background, I could see it getting utilized more than probably in a conventional unit. Yeah. Um, you're probably able to do some creative stuff. So we might have to do another conversation on that. But, dude, from engineer, Navy, Navy corpsman, Green Beret, yep. a Delta Force operator, and they go, like, hey, dude, I am I think I'm done. I'm going to pivot my my life, and I'm going to go play golf. I didn't mention swimming, too. Like, yeah. span the game, the game I've done, again. I've done it all, man. I mean, I have. there's a lot of things I still haven't done that um, I hope to to do, but um, here we are now playing golf for a living. And, um, how'd, you, how'd you get into that? I, you know, I played as a young kid. I played, I played, uh, I played a bunch as a young kid and, um, playing a bunch of these, um, I think it's called, uh, it's called a, uh, AJ American junior golf association. Yeah. It's like that they have like a circuit They did that. And then, um, when I was 17, my dad goes, Hey, you want to, you want to enter this tournament? You have to qualify for it. I said, okay. So he filled it all out for me. This is 1997. Okay, so just give you a little reference of how old I am. Uh, um, he fills it out and he goes, "Okay, your your uh, your your qualifying date is I think it was like May something." So I, I go out and play and uh, qualify, and he goes, "Okay, you got to qualify again." I said, I'm qualifying for the qualifying. He goes, <laughs> "Yeah, you're going to the U.S. Open." And I said, "What?" And I saw so <laughs> I uh, I qualified. They did 36 whole regional, and then lo and behold, I find myself at Congressional. 
in ninety in nineteen ninety seven. Um, so you know, didn't make the cut obviously, but uh, still still pretty cool story. And then I did it again in ninety nine. Um, and then uh, that was in college at the time in ninety nine, and I was swimming in my in the. I remember the Arizona golf coach was like, "Hey, you want to come play?" golf with us you can come play with us anytime so i had an opportunity to actually just kind of like still be engaged with with golf and um uh so yeah i mean like i've been playing since i I was a kid and then i took a big big time to hiatus and as you can imagine in 2000 basically from 2005 to 2012 ish i didn't play maybe five times it was drinking beer with your buddies and Rolling golf carts, you know what I mean? Yeah, 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 uh, yeah. And um, you know, I got married in 2010, in 2009, excuse me. And um, my wife, you know, we had moved to Bragg, and I'm in the Q4. So she's like, "You gotta, you gotta get out of the house because you're driving me nuts." So I picked up the golf clubs again and I started playing, um, and and really enjoyed it, man. And and uh, I enjoyed it to the to the point where it was like. It was a it was a release for me, you know what I mean. It, and to that to to this day, it still is a release. I know I'm a professional. I have to treat it a little bit differently, but man, it, it's not a job for me, right? Number like not a, it's not like it's not a job. It doesn't define me, but it 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 and it and it it gives me great joy to do it. You know what I mean? Even even when I'm playing my worst, which I've played my worst, you know what I mean? <laughs> I feel. I'm having a great time, man. And, and, um, I think maybe that's perspective. Um, you know, in the solo, like if you rewind, um, in my earlier days, I had a helicopter crash that almost killed me. You know what I mean? So, um, and then I had a vehicle rollover that almost killed me. So like I had a, I've had a myriad of things that like, I've come pretty close to, to death. And, and, uh, but now I'm like, I'm playing golf for a living. You know, like these young kids are like 22, 23 years old, fresh out of college, throwing golf clubs and throwing a fit and all this stuff. I'm like, man, if you, if I could just shoot walk one day in my shoes, you know what I mean? Or somebody else's shoes, not even mine, like just in a different perspective, you'd come back with, um, with a little bit different perspective on what this game really is. You know what I mean? Well, I think you, well, you probably, your shoes qualified to be, to walk, walk in to see, <laughs> see some shit. So. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I don't necessarily need, yeah, exactly. But like walk in your shoes, walk in yeah, just somebody yeah. else's shoes, you know what I mean? And, and, um, and, and gain a little perspective. Like when you're in the cauldron in a fire, you don't understand, you don't know where you are. You know what I mean? Sometimes it, it seems like a sea that is in a, in a, without a map, you know what I mean? And, um, and when you just step back and look, you know, like you're saying, the 60,000 foot view, you're like, oh, I'm here. I need to go here. My attitude isn't going to get me there. You know? <laughs> so, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, man, uh, I mean, I'm enjoying every second of it. And um, I've met some great people down here. I've met some, some people that I never thought I would meet um, doing this. And, and, um, and, I, and I'm just having a blind student. Uh, just hoping to make the PGA Tour here soon, sooner rather than later. The pressure. I I love the story, man, because from it's again for a dude to pivot out of the world you are in and to do something completely different is it's not that common of a thing to hear, right? Like you're like I know you played and you know as as a younger kid, right? But you've, in my opinion, you've taken a big big step into a different different direction which is is cool to hear that a lot of guys like hey this is what i did defines me in my career and i i dude, i love flying fighters like it was awesome uh, i'll tell stories about it every now and then right but that's not that's not who i am that's not the only thing right that was an awesome chapter of my life a lot of like, great things right you know but there's there's more to it than just this um yeah so well, you know dude, it's, yeah. it's kind of like is the is your is your proverbial book about your life one page 300 pages or 3,000 pages you know what I mean and yeah there's something that um kind of stuck with me as a kid somebody told me that I can't remember it wasn't my parents it was somebody and they were like you know you have the opportunity to live your life the way you want to right and and um if you do if you if you live your life the way you want to 
there's going to be challenges. There'll be pain. You'll have pleasure. You'll have all these things. But at the end of the day, you'll do stuff. You know what I mean? And I kind of like resolved myself early on in my life to just do stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> see how good I could get at it. You know what I mean? And, um, and uh, this is something I've always wanted to do. Even when I was a kid, I was like, I, you know, I would tell everybody, I'm going to go play professional golf for a living. Like that, you know, yeah. Um, had 9-11 not happened, John, I think maybe it would be a different story, but but uh, it did. So here we are, 43, trying to make it to the PGA Tour, you know? Dude, I love it. Yeah. Well, I'm going to ask you uh, in a second here, you know, if you found 15, 16-year-old Presh walking down the street, is there any advice you'd give him? But before I do that, would you be willing to hang around once we wrap up the podcast for a Dare I Was story, maybe tell – if you're willing to talk about the helicopter crash or the rollover, or maybe, you know, one of these, uh, a day in the life, a solo story, uh, trucking across Tajikistan or something sure. kind of crazy. Absolutely. So if, yeah. If you're willing to hang around for that, but yeah, dude, if you found 15, 16 year old, uh, fresh walking down the street, is there anything you would tell him to do different, change something, life advice? Keep doing what you're doing, man. You did the right thing. Big, yeah. I mean, it's, I, I don't, I, I, I do not regret anything I've ever done. And that's kind of a, people tell me that's a rare thing. And I said, well, in the, I've gotten that question before. Would you tell him something different? And I said, I said, no, I wouldn't tell him because where he's going to go is where is where he's destined to go. You know what I mean? So, yeah. um, yeah, that's, that's my answer. Yeah. No, I it's wouldn't simple. tell him shit. You're like, what's up? And then <laughs> he wouldn't listen anyways. That's what the guys are saying now. It's like, you know, I don't think I would listen to myself if I yeah, traveled back yeah, in time. Exactly. Like, yeah, so I was stubborn when I was 15, 16. <laughs> yeah. Still am. Yeah, dude, I know I know what I'm doing. So <laughs> Yes. Dude. <laughs> dude, I appreciate you taking the time. Join me on the podcast, man. This was fun. Absolutely. Man. Um and again, uh, gonna hang around for a there I was story. So dude, thanks, man. Thanks, John. Appreciate it, brother.